Hi guys, it is a spectacularly gorgeous, little bit chilly day. Here in the Point Lonesome Swamp, deep in the oasis of freedom here on this cool, crisp, but gorgeous, that would be, where are we? Tuesday, January 18th, 2022. And we have the little dog decked out in one of his jackets. Uh, but I got a lot on my plate today, guys. I almost wasn't going to uh, do a chronicle of the collapse, but I really appreciate uh, one of my lieutenants, Brother JJ, from up there in New York, baby, where I think it's like 19 degrees at JJ's house today uh, for doing my job for me, as he is so dependable at. And... Uh, so JJ has sent me a review of a new book by fellow Doomer, Vaclav Smil, I guess you pronounce S-M-I-L uh, as Smil, and Dr. Smil, I think he's Dr. Smil has a new book out that we're not going to get uh, to see until May. So maybe when the book comes out, we will do a full Doomsday Sermon. But this is a review uh, of the book titled, How the World Really Works, The Science Behind How We Got Here and Where We Are Going where uh, Vaclav is going to explain all this. And for those of you who uh, are not aware of this, Bill Gates says, Vaclav Smil is my favorite author. All right. If Vaclav is good enough for Uncle Billy, he's good enough for me. And uh, this is a review of Vaclav's new book by a fellow named Tom Chivers. Where do I recognize the name? Tom Chivers from this website called Unheard, H-E-R-D, being not part of the herd. All right. And his review of Vaclav's new book, How the World Really Works, is titled, How Long can humans survive this time of plenty will not last forever and uh well, dog, you just gonna hang out or all right i guess uh you can hang out take it away tom chivers and let us know what is on vaclav smeal's mind here in the year 2022 <clears throat> In the deep ocean, occasionally, a whale carcass falls to the bottom of the sea. Yeah, how many hundreds, if not thousands of times a year does a whale carcass fall to the bottom of the sea when it gets hit by a cargo ship or strangled up in uh, fishing lines? And anyway, we're not here to talk about whales exactly. A whale carcass falls to the bottom of the sea. Most of the time in the state of nature, creatures have just about enough to survive. But the first creatures to find the whale have found more food than they could ever eat. These scavengers live lives of extraordinary plenty. Some of the smaller, faster breeding species might do so for several generations. There is enough to go around a thousand times over for a while. And then the whale is gone and the creatures go back to their lives of crushing pressure, constant darkness, and an eternal knife edge struggle for survival. As Thomas Malthus had it in his bleak vision, organisms which increase exponentially in number will rapidly outgrow their resources, which can only grow arithmetically. So 
of course, the excess population which has grown up on this brief glut must die off. We are currently living in a time of whale fall, suggests the scientist Vaclav Smil in his new book, How the World Really Works. He doesn't use the word whale fall, of course. Credit for that macabre whale metaphor must go to Scott Alexander, but modern humans are animals. Did you realize that modern humans are animals? Modern humans are animals, products of evolution like any other animal, and yet we noticeably do not spend every minute of our everyday struggling to get the material required to survive. Well, I don't know about that. You and I need to go to the store to get some ice cream. Instead, we build cathedrals and watch football. We make art. We waste time on Twitter. And that is because we live on the gigantic blessed whale carcass that is our fossil fuel inheritance. <clears throat> For Smeal, our discussion about climate and energy are hamstrung because so few people actually understand how the world really works. Material lands in front of us in prepackaged convenient forms, shrunk wrap, shrink wrapped pork chops winter strawberries, lights that turn on when you flick a switch, phones made of plastic and metal. The world is a set of black boxes that we use, but in most cases do not understand. So when we say we need to cut back our carbon emissions, most of us do not really grasp the implications of doing that. But somehow all these incomprehensible processes are keeping us alive. And we should find it astonishing that they are able to do so. The demand for material, for energy and nutrients is greater than it has ever been. Hmm. The world's population has exploded. In 1800, there were about one billion humans. In 1950, there were two and a half billion. Now there are, according to this, 7.7 .7 billion. In my parents' lifetime, the number of humans alive has tripled. But amazingly, the amount of material available to each of them has increased even more, and that is in large part because of our use of fossil fuels. In 1800, almost all the energy used globally was in the form of human and animal muscles for mechanical work or plant matter burned for heat and light. Coal, the first widely used fossil fuel, was just starting to be used in steam engines in the UK, but it was negligible overall. By 1900, fossil fuels were the source for 50% of our energy. By 2000, they were the source of 87%. And as a result, our lives have been transformed. The amount of energy available to the world has increased 1,500 fold. That is only part of the story, though. Increased energy efficiency means that the gain in useful energy is more like 3,500 times and even though the world's population has gone up many times, quote, I guess quoting Vaclav Smil, quote, an average inhabitant of the earth nowadays has at their disposal nearly 700
hundred times more useful energy than their ancestors had at the beginning of the 19th century, close quote. But most of us don't realize how that energy is actually used. A large percentage of it, for instance, is used to create four materials which are the building blocks of modern society. Materials which are so ubiquitous that we barely notice them, even as we depend on them. Smeal identifies these four basic pillars of human civilization as steel, cement, plastic, obviously, and ammonia. Producing them takes enormous amounts of fossil fuels. It takes, for instance, 25 gigajoules of energy to produce one ton of steel, roughly twice the amount of energy used by the average UK household per year. In 2019, the world used 1.8 billion tons of steel. Its production is responsible for about 8% of the world's total carbon emissions. But we cannot do without steel. The frameworks of our cities are built of it. The pipes we send our water and gas through also. Our cars, our transporter ships, our knives and our cooking pots. Our machines for making all these things cement and plastic are similarly vital and are responsible for comparable amounts of our total carbon output. We cannot do without them and there is no easy carbon-free alternative way of making them. And then there is ammonia which rarely features in any conversation about cutting carbon emissions. Ammonia is a nitrogen atom ringed by four hydrogen atoms. Our atmosphere is 80% nitrogen by mass, but plants, which need it for growth, cannot easily take it out of the air. Instead, they need to gather it from the soil. Bacteria that live in the roots of some plants can fix it into the soil. Animal waste like manure have relatively high nitrogen content, but those methods can only support a certain amount of growth. You know, like the population of the planet uh, in 1800, about one billion people. <clears throat> In the beginning of the 20th century, a German chemist named Fritz Haber invented a process for getting nitrogen out of the air by making ammonia. That requires huge amounts of energy and hydrogen, usually taken from natural gas. We now spread hundreds of millions of tons of ammonia on our fields about 50% of the total nitrogen going into our food production comes from it. Smeal quotes an author writing in 1971, quote, industrial man no longer eats potatoes made from solar energy. Now he eats potatoes partly made of oil, close quote. This means the world is able to eat. The share of the global population that is underfed has plummeted even as the actual population has ballooned. About 65% of people could not get enough to eat in 1950 compared to about 9% in 2019. As Smeal puts it, so, in 1950, the world was able to supply adequate food to about 890 million people, but by 2019, that had risen to over 7 billion 
close quote. That is not entirely due to ammonia, but ammonia is a large part of the story. If fertilizer were removed, perhaps half of the world's population would starve. Agriculture, then, depends on the whale fall, the glut of energy provided by fossil fuels, our deep reliance on fossil fuels to create materials most of us do not appreciate we need is unnerving, especially when Smeal points out that much of the world, notably sub-Saharan Africa, lives on well below average levels of energy use. Africa uses just 5% of the world's total ammonia supplies, despite having 25% of the population. About 40% of the world, 3.1 billion people, has a per capita energy supply, quote, no higher than the rate achieved in Germany and France in 1860. <clears throat> In order to approach the threshold of a dignified standard of living, writes Smeal, those 3.1 billion people would at least need to double, but preferably triple, their per capita energy use, which is exactly what they're trying to do. Uh, in Africa and everywhere else is all of the, you know, people on the bottom of the food chain uh, try to get higher up like Americans. Can we do that while also reducing our carbon emissions? Not fast, says Smeal, for all the boasts and pledges, all the government targets for years ending in zero or five, about which Smeal is very sniffy, <laughs> very sniffy, the world relies too heavily on fossil fuels for too many things to rapidly stop using them. Even the International Energy <clears throat> Agency's optimistic sustainable development scenario projects that the share of fossil fuels in the world's energy mix will only drop to 56 percent by 2040 from today's 87 to 56 percent in the most optimistic scenario ain't gonna happen <clears throat> we can and need to replace fossil fuel energy sources with renewable ones. Now guys, I am not going to get in my own broken record rant about this. We are, we're, we're just gonna let this dude talk. I don't have time to get off on uh, why we cannot and do not need to replace fossil fuel energy sources with renewable ones, but anyway, going along with the, with the meme here, we can and need to replace fossil fuel energy sources with renewable ones, but there are obstacles beyond simply the political will. Yes, simply the political will, yes. Renewable energy is very good at making electricity, but electrical energy is not ideal for making the incredible heat needed for iron and steel production or cement. The Haber process for making ammonia works much more efficiently with natural gas uh, than electricity as a source of hydrogen than it does with water and electricity. And a way from the four pillars of civilization, fossil fuels have other huge advantages. They're very energy dense. You can store 
much more energy in a kilogram of kerosene than you can in a kilogram of battery, meaning that transatlantic flights are possible. And it keeps. Currently, there is no suitable way for storing electrical energy for more than a few hours or days, so solar energy stored up in summer is no use in winter. A barrel of oil will last indefinitely. Those facts will change, and Smeal is more downbeat than I am about how quickly that will happen, but we are definitely going to be relying on fossil fuels for some decades yet. But unlike the crabs and hagfish that eat the fallen whale, we are clever and we need not simply slink back into the darkness and starve. And here comes, you, you know, the, the hopium at the end. Smeal thinks there are major gains in efficiency which can be had over and above the enormous gains so far. He points to water use as an example. Uh, perhaps similar efficiencies can be found with energy and carbon. Besides, despite what I uh, a lot of people I have interviewed, uh, writer on Collapse Chronicles, might have to say about it. Besides, we are not about to run out of whale, at least not imminently. The raw materials, the metals and fuels that our lifestyle needs are still around in large amounts, but we have grown in numbers and lifestyle well beyond the capacity of the pre-whale fall world. And we do not want to go back to that lifestyle we had before, even if some romantics and millenarians might disagree. In fact, we, whoever the mythical we is, in fact, we want many more people to enjoy the spoils of whale fall. We have used fossil fuels to construct an astonishing world, one that feeds and houses an incredible number of people. We need to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels and the sooner the better. Again, not going to go off on that rant whether uh, we do or do not. But it, meaning weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels, will be a long and difficult job. As Smeal demonstrates, fossil fuels are threaded through our society at every level entwined like knotweed in the systems that provide our food, our housing, our machinery, our transportation. We forget how complex our society is until it stops working in some way, as when supply chains broke down in the pandemic. As it stands, as it stands, if we were to reduce fossil fuel consumption by the sort of degrees that some demand, it would lead to disaster because we have not unpicked the threads yet. There you go, there are many reasons that weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels uh, would be a disaster that he does not even go into here. There are many more reasons why weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels would be the single biggest disaster. And uh, as, as good of a job as fossil fuels are, you need to get that swirly like that. 
as good of a job as uh, fossil fuels are doing uh, bringing down this planet, uh, we will see the whole uh, concept of frying pan versus the fire when we supposedly get off of them. This is one more of the reasons we are doomed if we do, doomed if we don't. Fossil fuels, staying on fossil fuels, we are doomed. Getting off of fossil fuels, we are doomed. At least seven out of eight of us are because fossil fuels, a life without fossil fuels is a life for about one billion people. Anyway, I've got to wrap this up because I've got uh, places to go and people to meet and business to conduct here in our fossil fuel soaked society, probably starting uh, with a trip to the gas station to fill up my gas sucking truck. I highly suggest you get to the gas station and fill up your own gas sucking truck while you still can. Bye guys.